All right. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome again to Effective Altruism Global 2016. How's everybody feeling this morning? All right. Thank you. That's great. My name is Nathan LeBenz. I'm very excited to be here. It will be my pleasure to be the MC here on the main stage for the next two days. Starting in about 90 minutes, of course, you're going to have a wide range of options, many choices in terms of talks, workshops, participatory activities, places to mix and mingle. But for the next hour, we are here together as one group in this single auditorium. So it is my pleasure to begin today's program by introducing Will McGaskill. Will is a philosopher by training and by profession, having studied philosophy as an undergraduate at Cambridge and later earning a PhD at Oxford. He currently is the youngest tenured professor of philosophy in the world at Lincoln College at Oxford University. But I think what really makes Will stand out among philosophers is that he is a person of action. He's committed to making a difference in the world through his own decisions and also by leading and inspiring others. That's why in 2009, he founded Giving What We Can, a charity evaluator that has since directed millions of pounds to some of the world's most effective charities. In 2011, he also co-founded 80,000 Hours, a career consulting organization that advises talented young people on which career path can make the most impact while also being mindful of their personal values and goals. Will is the CEO of the Center for Effective Altruism, the organization that has put its time and energy into bringing us all together today because they sincerely believe that this is the best thing that we can all be doing with our time. And he is here to speak to us today about the past, the present, and the future of effective altruism. So to open today's conference, please join me in welcoming to the stage Professor Will McGaskill. Hello, Effective Altruism Global. Um, I say this every single year, and every single year that's true. Uh, welcome to the largest gathering of the Effective Altruism community that the world has ever seen. <laughs> Woo! So it's my absolute delight to um, introduce the conference on the past, present, and future of Effective Altruism. And I'm going to introduce Dr. Toby Ord, who will talk about the past of effective altruism before talking myself about what's happening at the moment and what the future of effective altruism might look like. And it's my absolute delight to introduce Toby because there's no one in the world who's had a bigger positive impact on my life than he has. I met Toby in the spring of 2009 in Oxford. Um, I'd had an idea for the PhD thesis, and my supervisor said, oh, if you're interested in that, you've got to talk to Toby. And so you might think, well, two Oxford philosophy graduate students meeting in the spring, the venue might be this really wonderful location. It might look something like this. Yeah, well, as many of you know, the most important conversation in my life actually happened in a graveyard. Um, now, this is an actual gravestone from the graveyard where we spoke. Though I admit it's something of an exaggeration, it was in my college in Oxford, and it's really a little bit more scenic, though there's still a lot of dead people there. Um, so I met Toby, and it was at a time of quite extreme moral turmoil for me. I was very influenced by the ideas of Peter Singer, and the previous summer I'd spent um, that summer fundraising for Care International, so I'd spent all day, every day, talking about extreme poverty and how much good we could do if we just um, chose to spend some of our money to fight global poverty. Um, but what I'd found coming to Oxford is that all the academics I spoke to, you know, there's a lot of hand-wringing, a lot of people accepted these ideas, but very few people were actually putting it into action. And that's why when I met Toby, I was completely blown away. We met up, it was meant to be for an hour, that conversation turned into five hours. Um, and if you've ever met Toby and know of his amazing ability to talk basically at length forever, um, you will know that that is no surprise. Though I wish it could have gone into the wee hours of the morning. He told me all sorts of weird ideas. 
He told me about this thing called a quality-adjusted life year. He told me about um, intestinal worms. He told me about the quantified impact of all the different foodstuffs or meat products you could buy or not, and how damaging they were in terms of animal welfare. He told me he was concerned about this thing called existential risk, and at the time, I thought he was literally insane. Um, <laughs> Uh, but most of all, he told me about his commitment that he'd made to give away most of his income over the course of his life. And at the time, he was actually, he was still a graduate student. He was just living on 9,000 pounds, saving 2,000 and donating a further 2,000. He planned to give away most of that. And had this idea for giving what we can, an organization that would encourage as many people as possible to give 10% of their income to the most effective charities. And at that point, I was just completely on board. I dropped all of my other projects just so that I could focus on this as much as I could. And happily, we co-founded Giving What We Can six months later. And since then, I've just really never looked back. Uh, so it's abs my absolute delight to introduce Toby to talk about the history of effective altruism. As I've said, there's no one who's had a more positive impact in my life. If it hadn't been for that uh, chance meeting with him back in 2009. I'd probably still be working on philosophy of language. I'd be in some dusty library somewhere, and my life would completely suck. So, um, with that note, here's Toby Ord to talk about the history of effective altruism. Here you go, Toby. Thanks, Will. Uh, uh, it's hard to uh, know what to say to that introduction. Uh, Actually, uh, if, uh, if I hadn't met Will, uh, I don't think uh, all of you would be here at the moment. Uh, he's done a huge amount to actually get effective altruism running, uh, also with giving what we can in those early days, which, which I'll explain in a moment. So to really situate uh, effective altruism uh, and the history of it, uh, I think it, it makes sense first to really take a step back uh, from this uh, graveyard discussion and the foundation of giving what we can, uh, and to think about the history of ideas. So, <sighs> the first really big idea uh, that's useful to, uh, uh, to give us some context is the scientific re revolution. Uh, the 1600s in Europe, uh, various scientific greats such as Copernicus, Galileo, and Newton, Newton and this fashionable gentleman, uh, Francis Bacon, who uh, took those ideas and really synthesized it, helped set up the Royal Society and really get science moving. Uh, the really interesting thing about the scientific revolution uh, is that up until that point, the idea of intellectual progress wasn't really there. Uh, people in the Middle Ages and uh, even the early Renaissance um, were looking back to the past. They, the whole narrative was about how the Greeks knew so much and the Romans knew a little bit less, uh, and then in the Dark Ages and the Middle Ages they knew less and less, and they were clinging to and trying to preserve the knowledge from the past, uh, which was seen as a diminishing supply. So, and when people wanted to know the answer to something, they would try to look it up in Aristotle uh, rather than go out and find out the answer themselves. Uh, with the scientific revolution, it really changed that narrative to be looking forward rather than back uh, and create a method for the systematic creation of knowledge. Uh, at this point, uh, we got the idea of the central role of mathematics in understanding the world uh, and the central role of experimentation as well. And it is still our best method of finding the truth. A hundred years later, uh, we started to see some applications of this outside of natural science. Uh, in Europe, uh, we had the Enlightenment. Uh, and this was the application of both reason and evidence to various things in society. And you, you'll start to see you know, uh, how this could be connecting into effective altruism. Uh, it created the fields such as uh, sociology, economics, and law. So it got into the social sciences. Uh, and perhaps most importantly, it involved rethinking political structures. Uh, so these were the ideas of, say, liberty, egality, fraternity that led to the, uh, the French Revolution, overthrowing absolute monarchy. Uh, also, the ideas behind the Declaration of Independence. Uh, and it also led to an end to unquestioned authority. Uh, that includes both political authority from the divine right of kings, and also an end to authority uh, from, uh, from the old masters, you know, authority from Aristotle and so forth. Uh, they challenged uh, these ideas and tried to see whether they're really correct. So how does effective altruism fit in with those two big ideas? Uh, well, one way to think about it uh, is that effective altruism is to the pursuit of the good as the scientific revolution was to the pursuit of the truth. Uh, 
Another way, uh, perhaps, to think about it, how does it, how does it interact with the Enlightenment? Well, the Enlightenment involved rethinking uh, the best political systems to have, whereas effective altruism rethinks the best actions, both personal actions and also perhaps uh, uh, larger government actions, such as how best to run an aid program or something like that, as opposed to how best to structure society. Uh, that's two major threads. A third major thread in the history of ideas, uh, which is really relevant to effective altruism, is uh, utilitarianism. Uh, and this really got out of the gates with Bentham uh, in 1780 when he published uh, the, an introduction to the principles and morals and legislation. This was an amazing document. Uh, he was a legal scholar in, in Britain. Uh, and he created utilitarianism uh, and this greatest happiness principle that the end of all uh, legislation should be to create the greatest happiness of society. Uh, and he then immediately applied it uh, into doing that. He aimed to create uh, a thoroughly utilitarian uh, setup of legislation. Uh, he didn't get all the way there. Um, and to radically improve public policy. Uh, and here are just a, a number of the things that happened, uh, and remember the date in 1780 uh, that he included in this. Uh, he advocated for individual and economic freedom, separation of church and state, equal rights for women in 1780, uh, the right to divorce, decriminalization of homosexuality, uh, the abolition of slavery, abolition of the death penalty, abolition of corporal punishment, and uh, respecting of animal welfare. Uh, and so we, we still don't even have all of these things today. Uh, but the types of things that he was deducing uh, from these principles actually looks a lot like, uh, like some of the effective altruist ideas. Uh, many of these have become commonplace, but it was an example of really trying to use reason and evidence in order to push things forward. Uh, his work was extended and developed and strengthened uh, by John Stuart Mill and Henry Sidgwick. Uh, and then uh, much more recently, uh, there was a lot of work by Peter Singer. Uh, in the 1970s, uh, where his focus wasn't on state action, but was on individual action. He made very strong and compelling cases for personal action on poverty and animal welfare. How does effective altruism fit into that? Well, effective altruism is not utilitarianism. It's a much broader church than that. Uh, it allows for many diverse views about what makes someone's life go well. It doesn't have to be just happiness. Uh, and also about many other things mattering as well, such as equality between people or rights or uh, many other aspects about morality. Um, the main similarities as I see them between th this utilitarian movement and the effective altruist movement uh, that there was a focus on going out and helping others, not just about keeping your hands clean and not doing any wrong. It was about actively going out and doing good. Uh, there was also a real focus on scale. If something was 10 or 100 times bigger, they really took that seriously and, and you know, made it of central importance uh, and involved being willing to question the status quo. So here's another couple of uh, things taking us more close to the present. Uh, and I think this is really interesting. Uh, in the history of medicine, the really biggest thing, I think, happened uh, in the uh, late 1800s, uh, which was where they applied the scientific method to medicine. This was, as you'll note, 200 years after the scientific method had been developed. Uh, and this was the first time that they actually tried to find out how to improve health, rather than just messing about, basically, uh, or respecting authority. Uh, the the you know, famous names are Ignat Semmelweis, John Snow, uh, no relation, uh, 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 Louis Pasteur, Robert Koch, um, they developed the germ theory of disease, uh, which led to the saving of, I guess, uh, hundreds of millions of lives at least, probably billions of lives, uh, really radical improvements as soon as they started applying science to medicine. Uh, and then another big breakthrough was the application of priority setting, which was the first time that people were trying to actually improve health as much as possible, to say, we want our population to be healthier rather than less healthy, so we'll actually prioritize based on how cost-effective these things are, so that with our limited budget, we produce as much health as possible. Uh, key moments, 1968, the development of the Quality Adjusted Life Year. Uh, 1999, uh, the establishment in the UK of the National Institute for Clinical Excellence, which tried to do this priority setting for health. Uh, really, really exciting and leading to kind of much better health outcomes. Uh, really similar story, interestingly, for global poverty. Uh, in the 1950s, uh, aid as we know it begins, uh, both in terms of uh, government and in terms of NGOs. Uh, and then the scientific method was applied quite a bit later. There was actually a long period with aid where the discussions were largely people uh, from the armchair 
uh, having disputes. So, for example, there's a famous one on, on bed mats uh, from Laria. Uh, would it be the case that if they charged a small amount of money instead of gave them away for free, would that mean that there was more uptake uh, and people who then respected the value of it and wouldn't use it for, as a fishing net or some other kind of uh, uh, bad use? Uh, there was a lot of back and forth about this, but all from the armchair. Uh, and then uh, people eventually decided, why don't we just find out? Why don't we apply our best method for seeking truth uh, to this question and get serious about it and just actually find out the answer? Uh, and that happened. Uh, they found out in that case that uh, actually you're better off giving them away for free. Uh, just uh, There's no more argument about that now because people actually just worked out the answer. In uh, uh, the 1990s, a lot of that happened. Uh, 2002, uh, IPA was established, Innovations in Poverty Action. Uh, 2003, J-PAL. Uh, and um, then priority setting came in at a similar time. Uh, these ideas of actually trying to improve lives of people in, in poor countries as much as possible. Uh, trying to say, why don't we do the things which are 100 times more effective? Uh, why are we doing something that only helps 100th as much as it could uh, when there's still these really great opportunities to be done? Uh, the World Development Report 1993 was a pivotal moment for that with uh, Dean Jameson and uh, Chris Murray. Uh, and then uh, the DCP project, um, WHO Choice. Uh, and then in 2007, uh, GiveWell was established. In 2008, they gave their first recommendations trying to help uh, the uh, individual donors uh, make decisions based on uh, evidence when it comes to development and also other areas. Uh, 2009, given what we can. So that's, that's the huge sweep of ideas and, and how, we kind of, how it brings us to the present day. But now I want to take a step back and just tell you a bit more personal uh, side of things. Uh, this is uh, the story of setting things up at Oxford. Uh, it's not the whole story of how uh, the kind of most recent part of effective altruism came to be, uh, but I thought you'd appreciate the bits that I was there for on the ground uh, and can speak the most to. In 2005, I was studying for the, uh, the BPhil degree at Oxford. Uh, there's this infamous examinations period where in the Oxford winter, we kind of isolate ourselves for 14 weeks and, uh, and write a whole lot of essays. Uh, and that was basically the whole assessment. And one of these essays I did, uh, I looked at the list of topics and saw this interesting topic about global poverty. Uh, in fact, it was called, uh, Ought We... Uh, whenever, what was it, ought we to forgo a luxury whenever we can thereby enable someone's life to be saved? And uh, it sounded a bit like your answer was obviously yes, but then if you think about it and how it applies to your life, you see that it means that perhaps you can never have any luxuries because every single time you should help people in poorer countries instead. So I thought about this a lot. I read uh, Peter Singer, Peter Unger, uh, and the really excellent writings that were there. And I, I'd always... <laughs> taken this seriously and wanted to do something about global poverty, but it had never been that central to me. And I had a couple of weeks just looking at these questions, and I had to really confront them and really think about it. And seeing these other people uh, paving some of the way for me there uh, was very valuable and made me think uh, that, yeah, uh, you know, I should do this. I should make this a central part of my life. I made a commitment to donate uh, most of my money over my life uh, and to live on a, on a limited income. And uh, I talked about that a lot with my wife. Uh, and then in 2006, I decided that I needed to set up some kind of organization to help other people do this too. Uh, people had contacted me saying, I want to, uh, to join you in doing this, and I needed some way of getting that to work. Uh, and I had the idea for an organization that would involve both uh, giving more and giving more effectively. But I didn't have all the pieces of exactly how to set it up. Over the next couple of years, I iterated on this. I kept thinking about it, kept taking it to other people in Oxford, talked to everyone who had listened to me uh, about these topics, uh, got lots of feedback, kept improving the ideas. Um, and at some point there, I actually had to finish my PhD as well. <laughs> and uh, uh, that was a bit of a distraction. Uh, but then shortly after handing in my PhD, a couple of weeks later, uh, I got this email saying I should meet this uh, Will Crouch chap. Uh, and all I knew about him at that point was that he was uh, studying the same degree I'd studied, the BPhil, and that he was going to be wearing a tweed jacket, so I'd recognize him. Uh, so uh, he brought me into this graveyard uh, at his college, uh, and uh, 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 I'd met, finally, a really kindred spirit who uh, was really excited by this project, was interested in all these ideas that we had. In fact, as well as the ones he mentioned, uh, we're already talking about uh, career choice and uh, counterfactuals and how, how they can be relevant in career choice at that point. 
Uh, as uh, I think Ben Todd has said, he's going to be uh, saying that that's not quite as important as we first thought. Uh, at <laughs> so uh, uh, be interested to see what he has to say on that. Uh, and then with Will present, things really rocketed along. Um, we could just, you know, we just got together, spent all of our time on this, uh, really pushed it forward to the launch uh, a few months later. Uh, we had this launch, and here are a few kind of uh, a few memories. Uh, that's uh, Alan Fennick from SCI, uh, our first recommended charity, uh, who's, who's here today, uh, uh, who is, uh, I think, thanking uh, uh, my wife and I. Uh, and there's, there's various people in the audience who are still around, still part of effective altruism. Uh, in this picture, there's, uh, there's Ben Todd uh, from 80,000 Hours. There's uh, Pablo Staffarini from CEA, uh, Michelle Hutchinson, uh, given what we can, and now the, uh, the Oxford Institute for Effective Altruism. Uh, and I think, uh, that, is that Will? Uh, back, uh, back when his hair was a little bit longer. Uh, and uh, uh, this, it really took off uh, when we launched this. We weren't sure what the reception would be. Uh, there was, that, but there was a flood of media interest. Uh, here are a few clippings they had. Uh, and a lot of people thought, this is never really going to take off, is it? Uh, you know, they, they were excited to talk to me, and they thought it was an interesting story. Uh, but they kept saying, no one's really going to do this, are they? Uh, and we had 23 people at that point, uh, our kind of founding uh, members who'd taken this 10% pledge, uh, including, I, I think, it, maybe about a quarter of them are here uh, at uh, uh, EA Global. Um, uh, more people wanted to join. Uh, I got to the uh, dining table and uh, started sending out forms to people uh, so that they could uh, uh, get the information and, uh, and sign up. Uh, our membership started growing very rapidly. Uh, it's about 90% uh, annual growth uh, over that period, uh, taking us to about, two, about 100 times as many members as we had uh, just uh, uh, six and a half years ago, uh, almost 2,000 members. Uh, in fact, uh, a really amazing uh, moment was when I was at, uh, the, in Seattle uh, at a meeting where we were rethinking uh, the disability adjusted life year, the DALI, uh, and changing the definition and improving it. Uh, and I noticed that at a meeting of about 20 people, uh, one quarter of the people who were making this decision uh, were given what we can members. Uh, it's it's uh, both a grassroots movement, but it also has a lot of support from people who are uh, really at the heart of uh, cost effectiveness and uh, priority setting in the world. This is a, a, a chart of the amount of money pledged. Uh, both these things I find really humbling uh, to see how much it's grown, uh, how uh, the initial uh, skeptics were wrong, and how many people have joined and are willing to actually put their money where their mouth is in terms of helping the world uh, to both give more and give more effectively, getting this multiplicative benefit between the two. Um, uh, you know, for example, if you, if you give 10 times more and give it to a place uh, which is 10 times as effective than having 100 times the impact with your giving, uh, so many people have joined with this. Uh, a little bit later, uh, uh, in 2011, uh, 80,000 Hours was launched uh, by, uh, by Will and Ben. Uh, it involved this radical rethinking of how ethical careers should work. Uh, the initial focuses were on impact uh, of, of your career, which, believe it or not, no one else was looking at. They were just looking at don't do harm, basically, rather than actually doing good with your career, uh, or at least largely. Um, uh, also at uh, the counterfactuals uh, and on the idea of earning to give uh, was a kind of radical new idea that, that we were pushing. Uh, and this brought many new people from Oxford uh, into this mix of ideas, and it was a really exciting time. Uh, here's there to embarrass Ben. Here's, uh, here's their early logo. Uh, in fact, something that not many people will know here is that uh, 80,000 Hours uh, was originally called High Impact Careers, and something that, that it, fewer of you will know was that in between the two, it was briefly 70,000 Hours. Uh, and then at, at some point, uh, we, we gained another 10,000 Hours. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and now that we had these two different organizations and this cluster of ideas and people working on them and trying to think about whether we could set up other things to kind of broaden this portfolio, uh, we set up something called uh, the Center for Effective Altruism. Uh, and when we were coming up with a name for this organization, uh, that was actually, we ended up naming this wider movement. Uh, we weren't actually sure the name was really going to get used very much, but we uh, had a long series of discussions and eventually settled on effective altruism. Uh, and what's quite amazing to me now is that that was less than five years ago uh, that the name effective altruism was coined. Uh, the roots of effective altruism go back further than that, but it's, just, it's quite, quite interesting that it's such a recent uh, name that we've all been united under. 
Uh, CEA was an umbrella organization uh, for these different projects and an incubator for new projects uh, involving, uh, given what we can, 80,000 hours, uh, the life you can save, animal charity evaluators, global priorities project, and EA outreach. Uh, some of them found that they, they only need the incubation for a while, we spun them out, and uh, uh, other ones are still with us. Uh, in in that, that summer, I thought I'd give you a few photos. Uh, we, we didn't have any office space, and we, we approached the university. Uh, Michelle tried to work out how to get some office space for us, and the only place she could find over the summer uh, was at her college, Exeter. Uh, we, here is uh, Michelle and Holly working, and you, what you can't quite see from there is uh, where they were working. We were on a balcony above an old uh, medieval hall. Uh, and we had <laughs> this strip about four meters wide by 10 meters long, and that was our office. Uh, we also had uh, various meetings and retreats, trying to you know, organize the, the community of people in Oxford interested in effective altruism, get them talking about a lot of things. This is a debate that we had um, in the grounds of a castle in Wales. So we also continued our academic work. Um, writing papers on the moral importance of cost-effectiveness, uh, contributing back to the priority-setting community, uh, such as uh, J-PAL and economics, um, uh, uh, the WHO. Uh, and in 2014, we had our first academic conference uh, called Good Done Right at Oxford. Here are a couple of photos. That's Derek Parfitt, uh, my old uh, uh, PhD supervisor, uh, who actually has a whole lot of really kind of proto-EA ideas, and ideas that are actually quite foundational. I'll get to one at the end. Here he's giving a talk about population ethics uh, to the audience there. Now, that's a bit of the Oxford story, but let's zoom out a little bit more. Um, there were many things happening further afield as well at the same time. Uh, one of them uh, was uh, GiveWell, uh, founded in uh, late uh, 2007, first uh, charity recommendations in 2008. Uh, initially, there was uh, they were looking at multiple different areas, uh, such as uh, education in uh, New York City uh, for disadvantaged kids, as well as global poverty. Um, over the years, they realized that actually these, these ones helping people in America couldn't really keep up in terms of the effectiveness, uh, and that, uh, that they really had to make a decision to just focus on, on global poverty, because that was where they could do so much more to help people. Uh, and uh, in uh, 2011, uh, they allied with Good Ventures. That was a really major transition for, for GiveWell, uh, meaning that they were both a grassroots kind of helping uh, advice organization, but also uh, advising uh, this really large fund that was had really based on EA principles. Uh, and also set up what became uh, the Open Philanthropy Project, uh, an arm of GiveWell, uh, well, in collaboration with Good Ventures, uh, looking at bigger questions outside of global poverty, re-extending the set of areas they were looking at, uh, but to try to include various things that could be really high impact in other areas. Uh, another really exciting development, I think. Uh, there's also uh, the rationalism community. Uh, so the, the aims of the, uh, the rationalist community were helping people to have more accurate beliefs about the world and helping people to better achieve those aims, uh, whatever their aims are. Uh, that's, the first is called theoretical rationality, and the second, practical rationality. Uh, and there was also a lot of uh, questioning of conventional wisdom. Uh, this, uh, two major uh, parts of this uh, were overcoming bias, um, a blog with Robin Hansen and uh, Eliezer um, in uh, uh, 2006, and uh, Less Wrong in 2009. Uh, I was working at the Future of Humanity Institute in Oxford, and, uh, which was a sponsor of both of these, uh, and I was involved in, uh, in, in that as well. Um, in fact, uh, it was actually, I was the person who was responsible for telling them about GiveWell uh, and uh, connecting that together, which turned out to be a, a marriage made in heaven for the, uh, the less wrong folk who wanted to get quantitative about charity. Uh, and there was lots of discussion there about existential risk, um, and a growing amount of discussion over the years about what, was, what they were calling optimal philanthropy, um, or if it, you know, what we think of as effective giving. Uh, another thread uh, was, a, again, uh, a utilitarianism community, um, particularly around uh, a site called uh, Philosophia um, from 2006. And lots of interesting ideas were being discussed there, including questions like, should we give uh, now or should we invest the money and give later when you can give more? Um, and uh, lots of questions which are, which are central to effective altruism. Uh, started in, in 2006. Uh, some of the key people from that are here as well. 
um, uh, and they were looking to uh, apply utilitarian principles into action uh, more than just doing theory. Uh, many more organizations as well, um, uh, particularly as time has gone on. Uh, too many to list. Okay, so let's finally go back out to the big picture again. So one question that, that I hear occasionally, and I think it's a good question and a, a challenging question, is why hasn't effective altruism happened already? Uh, if these ideas we've got, um, which involve sometimes radical rethinking of, of our role in society, saying that uh, it's not good enough perhaps to just have a life where you don't do any harm, uh, but instead there's something really important about going out and doing a lot of good in the world and using reason and evidence to work out how to do that good rather than just using your intuition or, uh, or, or following what everyone else is doing. Um, if we're really right about that, and it's, it's quite different to common sense, you know, why, what's going on there? How do we explain that? Um, why would we be right and other people be wrong? Or how does that work? Um, uh, and maybe the, the challenge is that if this is such a good idea, why hasn't it already happened? And I think there's actually some very good answers to that. So firstly, there have been people with the EA mindset over history. Uh, John Wesley is an example. Uh, Jeff Kaufman um, did some good work finding uh, cases of him directly advocating earning to give uh, centuries ago. Uh, Jeremy Bentham, I already mentioned, is another good example. Uh, but things have changed recently to allow a community to develop around this. Uh, one is education. Uh, there's much more mathematical and scientific uh, literacy in the world, so people are, have the tools needed to understand a lot of these, these concepts. Uh, the internet has been huge. It's enabled uh, people with this mindset to find each other and build a community. Uh, and uh, you know, it's the type of thing that labels communities where uh, even if only 1% of the people find this really interesting and passionate, they would find it hard to find each other in a pre-internet world, but now it's been able to build this global community. Uh, data, uh, there's much more information about what's effective now, which, if, yeah, which, which really helps things uh, get moving. Uh, and one thing I think is really interesting and not many people might be aware of is impact. Uh, it's actually only relatively recently that we've been able to do so much. So here's, here are some more details on, on these different cause areas. So global poverty. Uh, we've only really been able to help since the 1950s. Uh, prior to that, state-based aid was actually imperial um, aid uh, through the British Empire prior to World War II. Um, and, uh, and NGOs didn't exist. Uh, instead, it was, uh, it was missionaries uh, that you could fund. But it was a lot less clear that that was actually going to help people in poor countries. Uh, scientific evidence based on effectiveness has only really been around since the 1990s. And so actually, give well and give what we can seem to have arisen almost as soon as they possibly could. Uh, animal welfare, uh, factory farming, has only become widespread in the 1960s. Uh, and then it was only a decade later when uh, Peter Singer made his rallying cry uh, to say that this was really problematic and we needed to take a whole lot of personal action in order to stop it. Uh, existential risk. Uh, the uh, if people see my poster in the poster session, I explain this, but uh, the background natural risks are actually quite small, less than um, a tenth of a percent per century. Uh, that's still significant, uh, but it was in the 1950s and 60s, uh, with the development of thermonuclear weapons and the stockpiles of them that the USA and the USSR produced, uh, that uh, mankind first developed the power to really destroy itself. And then this anthropogenic risk of extinction arose, uh, which was much greater than the natural risk. And as soon as that happened, uh, there was an anti-nuclear community uh, in my parents' generation. And, and you know, they were part of it. I'm sure many of your parents are part of it. Um, and there was a passion about this. Uh, and then concern about existential risk is a natural generalization of that to say, well, it's not just nuclear weapons we care about. We care about the next technology like that that could threaten us uh, as well. Let's try to be proactive about it and think things through, uh, try to minimize those risks to the flourishing of humanity. So since the 1950s, uh, we've entered this new era of opportunities for ethical impact. Um, the good cost effectiveness information has only really come in since the 1990s. In some fields, uh, like animal welfare, it's still hard to get good cost effectiveness uh, estimates. Uh, and so there just really hasn't been much time for common sense about ethics to catch up. 
Uh, so I'm actually, I really think that this is uh, the way of the future here, uh, and that uh, common sense will relatively quickly shift. It already has in, uh, in the, the charitable world. GiveWell did a whole lot of really good work on this, getting people to focus less on um, cost-effectiveness ratios, and in fact, to pretty much dismiss them. Uh, it's now not okay to talk about cost-effectiveness ratios, as in the amount spent on, on overhead, I should say, uh, overhead ratios, um, because that's just not relevant. What you really care about is the impact. So I think common sense is changing, and I think uh, this is actually the way of the future. So finally, uh, where does this look like it's heading? And, uh, and I, I'm optimistic about it. Uh, Derek Parford, uh, who you saw earlier, uh, in his magnum opus, uh, Reasons and Persons, which is uh, um, probably the most influential work of philosophy in the 20th century, uh, he has this final chapter, just right at the end of this incredibly long and difficult book, uh, which is called How Both Human History and the History of Ethics May Be Just Beginning. And in that chapter, like, it's just a few pages, uh, he introduces and really uh, uh, advocates for the idea of uh, existential risk as a really big concern for humanity, and that it may be one of the most important moral issues, uh, which I thought was a very, very interesting and, and powerful idea uh, when I read it. Uh, and he also says that, and he thinks it's so important because human history may be only really just beginning. We talked a bit about the history of ideas, but there's many, you know, potentially many more thousands of years to come, and many more great things that humanity will achieve. And that's why he thought that it was really important to keep it alive. Uh, and he also thought that the history of ethics may be only just beginning. Uh, and he, he pointed out that actually almost all ethics that had been done prior to the 20th century uh, was in religious context uh, with people um, in, in a very focused way, uh, looking back again to the things that have been said thousands of years ago and trying to reinterpret them, rather than rethinking some of the, the principles and trying to be a bit more revisionary uh, and, uh, and forward thinking about it. Uh, and he pointed out that actually only uh, until the 1960s, there were only about a dozen people who'd ever made uh, a uh, non-religious approach to ethics their life's work. Um, just, you know, about, a, you know, just a, you could count them on your fingers, the number of people that even tried that. Uh, so it's actually only very recently uh, that people have really been thinking about this seriously, pushing forward, trying to understand the world, now placing it, what we should do about it, and uh, uh, how we should care for the future in each other. Uh, and so he says uh, that he's very optimistic about the future of ethics, uh, and I am too, uh, and particularly about practical action with that. Um, uh, he's a Given What We Can member as well, and uh, I... Uh, been, has been an inspiration to me. Thank you. Back to Will. Great, thank you, Toby. So, after he talks about the history, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we've achieved um, over the last year, um, the future potential of effective altruism, and then how that relates to the conference today and tomorrow. So, in terms of the present, what's been happening over the last year? So, one big thing was the reception. So, the books by Peter Singer and myself were just launched um, just before last year's Effective Altruism Global. But we've now seen really how they've been received. And it's actually been pretty remarkable how positive it was. I expected these ideas to be met with a lot of resistance, a lot of controversiality, a lot of people to get annoyed by them. But actually, it's been really remarkably um, positive, in fact. There's been positive reviews from people like Reid Hoffman, co-founder of LinkedIn, um, from Tim Ferriss of the 4-Hour Workweek, uh, from Nick Kristoff, the New York Times journalist, Alexander Wolf from the Wall Street Journal, um, and even the CEO of uh, the Gates Foundation, Sue Desmond Hellman, as well, has become a promoter of these ideas. So the section overall has been remarkably positive. It's really been wonderful to see. Of course, as with all kind of new ideas, there's been some um, criticisms as well, and also some of the views that have been somewhat bizarre. So this one, for example, on treehugger.com that is, you know, objects to the idea at quite some length of this book written by this professor of psychology, William McAllister, um, and goes on at length to talk about how much of an idiot William McAllister is. So I'm really happy that I didn't write that book because it sounds like it's just full of mistakes. But I am quite happy that now every mistake I make, I have someone to blame it on. I can be like, no, no, that was William McAllister's thing. <laughs> He's a psychologist. They don't know anything. <laughs> um, so 
books have had a remarkable reception, but obviously what we care about is impact. But in terms of that, I think things have been even better again. So when we look at um, the main effect of altruist groups and how their impact measures have increased over the last year, it's really been pretty astonishing. And it's quite clear that we're experiencing something like exponential growth. So this is GiveWell. Um, as you can see, the amount of money they're moving to their top recommended charities is growing hugely. And this year, they exceeded $100 million to their top charities. It's absolutely fantastic. That means 50,000 households have had their incomes doubled over the year as a result of direct cash transfers. Eight million bed nets have been distributed um, through the Against Malaria Foundation. And 15 million deworming tablets have been distributed through SEI and Deworm the World. And that amounts to um, something like, you know, obviously these are estimates, can't take cost effectiveness estimates literally and so on. But given our best guesses, uh, that means at least 10,000 lives have been saved. And that's really pretty phenomenal. Yeah, good, yeah, good work, give well. <laughs> um, other organizations, it's actually been a similar story. So you saw the growth chart for giving what we can. Um, one thing to point out about that, so we're now almost 2,000 members, almost $800 million pledges, pledged. Yeah, to put that in context, to context, for the three years before Giving What We Can launched, when Toby was talking about it, and you know, when he and I were trying to get as many members as possible, up until that point, we had 23 members. Given what we can now get that many members, um, over that many members every two weeks. Um, so it's an astonishing change in the kind of rate of growth. Um, with 80,000 hours, it's just, you know, maybe the story is even more extreme. It's got this kind of hockey stick um, growth trajectory as well. There's now hundreds of people every year who are significantly changing their career plans um, in a way that they believe will do a lot more good on the basis of the advice that 80,000 hours is giving. And there's just so many organizations doing this. So the Life You Can Save, which is Peter Singer and Charlie Bresler's organization, encourages people to give, make at least a 1% pledge uh, to global poverty charities. Um, in 2015, it raised over $1.5 million. Raising for Effective Giving, um, which encourages poker players to make a 2% pledge of their winnings, moved about $600,000. Animal Charity Evaluators, which is the Give Well for Animal Charities, um, moved over $800,000 to top charities. Apparently in 2016, it's already done more than that. And Founders Pledge, a very new organization within the effect of autism community, which encourages entrepreneurs to give 2% of uh, their earnings um, on exit, so 2% of the profit they make when their company exits uh, to whatever charities they prefer in just a year, it's raised over $100 million in legally binding pledges. So in terms of the amount of money that we're raising, it's just really pretty astonishing, um, even compared to one year ago, and certainly compared to just a few years ago. And there's impact that we're having um, through other means as well in terms of outreach. So here are more some like, other miscellaneous bits of impact. So Charity Entrepreneurship launched a new organization, actually officially launched it just two days ago called Charity Science Health. And I'm super excited about this because this is the first nonprofit directly focused on global poverty to have come out of uh, the effect of altruism community. Um, and that's from Joey and Kate just going to um, developing countries, figuring out what are the things that are most important that we could potentially um, turn into an extremely effective charity and just going out and doing that. So it's been incredibly impressive. Similarly with WAVE, which has had incredible growth. So this is a for-profit organization, again, set up by someone in the effect of altruism community and hiring many people in the community, which makes remittances cheaper for um, people in the US to send remittances back to East Africa. And this is potentially huge. I mean, the global flows of remittances are about $500 billion every year. And again, they've been experiencing astonishing growth. They're now one of the top um, senders of remittances in the US to East Africa, um, and they've saved their users over a million dollars already. Um, Dot Impact launched Students for High Impact Charity. That's an organization that's trying to develop effective altruism as a curriculum um, for people while they're still in school. Um, that's, we've held four EA Global X events. There's seven more to come, including just next week, there's going to be one in Nairobi, which I'm particularly excited about. We now have over 100 local groups all around the world. 
So there's so just tremendous growth um, within effective altruism. And over the last year, more than anything, I mean, these are all kind of quantitative effects and figures, but more than anything, effective altruism started to feel like a real thing. Um, I now talk to journalists, and they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, that was, a, that was a really good article on earning to give, as if this concept has just been around there since forever. Um, uh, people now write academic articles, you know, debating and criticizing effective altruism, as, again, as if it's a kind of real institution. People donate to the center, um, just not even because they're that involved with effective altruism, but just because they think it's a good thing to donate to, in the same way as someone might donate to Oxfam or to the United Way. So it really feels like this is a year when effective altruism is entering the mainstream. It's starting to become a concept that many, many people are very familiar with. So that's been tremendously exciting. And it raises the question, well, if so, what's going to happen in the future? So let's just engage in a thought experiment and imagine that this sort of exponential growth, which means, you know, it's been about doubling every 18 months. Supposing that trend were to continue, what would the world look like in 10 years' time, for example? Well, if so, if it continued for the next 10 years, giving what we can would have $100 billion in pledges. It would become the de facto biggest foundation in the world. GiveWell and the Open Philanthropy Project would be moving more than $10 billion a year to the most effective charities. And around the world, hundreds of thousands of people would self-identify as part of the effective altruism community. And, you know, let's indulge further. What if we think 20 years out, what would the world look like then? Well, if it continued for the next 20 years, well, perhaps cause prioritization would become, rather than this very niche thing that it's only really us that are really seriously thinking about that and a couple of small other organizations, perhaps would become a major field of research. Um, you could imagine politicians, prime ministers, presidents, incorporating the ideas of effective altruism into the political platforms in which they stand. And ultimately, you could imagine the idea of effective altruism, the idea of using evidence and reason to try and promote the welfare of all, to become just as common sense as the scientific method is common sense today. Perhaps you've still got some people debating it, but it's kind of far from the mainstream. And so that's imagining if this kind of growth trend continues over the next decade, the next couple of decades. And of course, we should think that this is just very unlikely. I mean, this would be huge. It'd be completely changing the world. But I think it's a real possibility now. I think we actually can think, wow, yeah, maybe we can achieve this. Maybe over the long run, if we keep working on this, this actually is within our power. And it might well be that a significant fraction of the expected value of what we're doing today, as well as having this direct benefit, comes from this long-run um, potential to really change the mindsets of the people all around the world. And so it's worth thinking, well, if we did get to that sort of stage, where would the value be coming from? And so one thing, of course, is just better allocation of resources. So of the sort of causes that we think of today, that we think of as priority causes, global poverty, factory farming, um, global catastrophic risks, if we were able to get this sort of mindset change on such a large scale, these problems start to look kind of trivial almost. So I mean, to put this in context for extreme poverty, if we imagine that the, built, the top one billion wealthiest people, if over one year they just kept their wealth at the same level, so you're just taking the interest on that wealth, nothing more. So no one's being made worse off than they were before. And that money were redistributed to the very poorest billion people in the world. Well, you would double the income of all the poorest billion people in the world. That alone would eradicate extreme poverty. And that's just about people's mindsets. That's about how people choose to spend their resources. And that's even on the problem that perhaps requires the biggest amount of resources, which is global poverty. When we look at factory farming, when we look at existential risks, those are problems that really just are about people's attitudes. We don't need to have factory farms. We don't need to be taking risks with the long-run future of the human race. So if we do have this power to change people's minds on this grand scale, well, we really have an astonishing ability to make the world a better place. But I think there's also a subtle and more and potentially even larger benefit that's worth thinking about, which is the potential to drive forward moral progress. So if you look at the history of ideas, the history of the human race, in every single generation, 
there have been huge moral atrocities that have been committed by the people of that generation that at the time just seemed obvious, just seemed like common sense that you'd engage in this sort of thing. Just people were completely oblivious to the fact of how wrong that was. So Aristotle spent his entire life dedicated to thinking about what's an ethical life to lead. And it just didn't occur to him that maybe keeping slaves was a wrong thing to do. Um, and that's a pretty astonishing fact. He was one of the smartest people in the world at the time. He spent all his time thinking about this, and it was still oblivious. But when we look at the history of the human race, as well as slavery, as well as treatment of foreigners, the subjugation of women, um, persecution of people who aren't heterosexual, over and over again, persecution of animals today, perhaps, over and over again, we see people oblivious to these moral problems. <laughs> um, Hopefully that's not amen to being oblivious, but to trying to recognize those problems. Um, uh, but yeah, so I mean, the question then is, it would be very unlikely if we've discovered all of them today. It would be very unlikely if we were the generation that have figured it all out. So the thing that we should be thinking about are, what are the sorts of major moral problems that in several hundred years we'll look back and think, wow, we were barbarians? What are the sort of major issues that perhaps we haven't even conceptualized today. And I kind of refer to this as cause X. So this is what I think you could think of as a, a major aim of the effective altruism community is to discover this cause X, this cause that's one of the most important moral problems of our time, but perhaps we even, haven't even conceptualized it yet. Or perhaps we'd find the idea laughable as you know, 200 years ago, people would have found the idea of animal welfare um, laughable, or perhaps existential risks laughable. Or perhaps it's something that we are aware of, but for just very bad reasons, we've kind of deprioritized. And I think there, that's perhaps the most exciting or interesting way in which we could have this huge positive impact on the world, is if we can drive forward moral progress and you know, figure out the problems that we're not even aware of today. And that takes us back to today. So the theme of this conference is effective altruism as an intellectual project. Of course, that's not all there is to effective altruism, but it's the focus of this conference. And it's the intellectual project of asking, how can, I, how can we help others by as much as possible? How can we do the most good? And in that sense, effective altruism, it's not an ideology. It's not a set of prescriptions. It's not a body of facts. It's not a set of recommended charities. It's not even a list of preferred causes. Um, it's a methodology. It's a pursuit of a question. And that means we need to be kind of constantly trying to you know, revitalize ourselves, address this question, keep thinking about what the best ways of doing good are, what ways we might be wrong. And you know, effective altruism is concerned with these intellectual issues, not because we're a bunch of nerds and because you know, we're just interested in puzzles, nor is it the case that we're just a bunch of jerks and we want to belittle causes that we don't like. Um, but it's because we just care very deeply about the plight of others. We see there's a huge amount of suffering and injustice in the world, and we want to be able to help. And we know that if we just posture and assume that we know everything, well, that's not going to be the best way of helping. Um, we, need, we just need to appreciate that we don't know what the best way of doing good is, and we need to figure that out. I mean, if you look at the history of um, improvements in the lot of people's lives, um, a lot of that is driven by intellectual progress. It was intellectual progress that allowed us to just, you know, develop the scientific method, develop vaccines, eradicate smallpox that saved over 60 million lives, bring polio and measles close to eradication, make the world richer such that um, basically everyone in the world is far richer than humanity has ever been for most of its life. It's because of that intellectual progress that we've been able to have these achievements. And when we look to the future, um, well, things are going to change a lot again. That means we need to constantly keep this flame of intellectual curiosity burning because circumstances and opportunities are going to be very different in five, ten years than they are now. And when that comes to the day, there's, you know, these incredibly important questions that we need to address that might have huge potential. Can we use CRISPR to um, end malaria? Um, can we develop meat substitutes that just render people's uh, desire for meat irrelevant and completely end the factory farming industry? Can we um, develop better forecasting methods so that we can better predict geopolitical events? Um, these are the kind of cutting edge of 
um, intellectual and technological progress today, and they have a huge potential, if done correctly, to make the world better. So that's why the focus of this conference is on effective altruism, and it's an intellectual project. And that's why I want to suggest that the kind of key thing to take with you through this conference is to think, well, what's the biggest, most important issues in which you still might be uncertain, in which you might be very wrong? And in which case, think, what could you do? What could you, who could you talk to? What talks could you go to that could potentially change your mind on that issue? And if you do see people who are changing their mind and say, yeah, wow, I've had this crucial consideration, and I realize that things are just radically different in, in terms of how I should evaluate my options than they were before, you know, celebrate that, applaud that, because that's the most important thing, is that the ability to change our minds in light of new evidence um, and to move on to, you know, maybe accept that beliefs that we found, you know, that we cherished, cause areas that we were really personally attached to, you know, maybe they're not the best thing, maybe there are other be better ways of doing it. So yeah, it's only by constantly learning, being able to constantly appreciate new ideas, new arguments, and new evidence, by constantly learning and being willing to change our mind. That's the only way that we're going to be able to do the most good. So thank you.